Good morning, Lakeview. It's good to see you all here. I hope you had a great time celebrating the, our Independence Day, the 4th of July, this last week. Um, this song that we're going to stand and sing, our national anthem. This was really written during the War of 1812 when, you know, we had a new nation only, you know, a few decades earlier and the British were trying to take us over again. But um, this is written from the viewpoint of the man who was on a ship in Baltimore Harbor when the battle was going on in Baltimore, Fort McHenry, I believe, and then uh, wondering if the flag over Fort McHenry was still going to be there in the morning. And all the smoke from all the cannon fire in the evening and then in the morning, he was not surprised, but relieved to see that the flag was still there. And that's what these lyrics are about. So let's all stand as we sing. I just want to welcome you this morning. 
If there's anyone who is new here this morning, my name is Matthew. I am the pastor here at Lakeview. And I was thinking about something that could encourage you this morning. Um, you know, God has been teaching me a lot this week about the concept of rest. And I was thinking about this morning and just God has been teaching me that you can rest in the middle of your trial. You can rest in the middle of a storm in life. You can, because of Jesus Christ, you can have access to a peace that goes beyond all of your ability to comprehend or make sense of why can I have this peace. You can have that because of relationship with Jesus Christ this morning. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. Father, we're asking that you would just be the very center of this service today. Lord, that you would be at the center of our hearts, the center of our minds, the center of our conversation, that our words would be glorifying to you, that our words would lift up others. Lord, help this congregation to know because of the great sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, that we can have a rest and a peace amidst the storms of life. It is the privilege of a believer that we can have these things. So let us rejoice in that today. We bind and cast out the devil today that he may have no power here, that ears would be open and hearts and minds would be open um, to, not just to uh, lift your praises, but to hear your words. And Lord, that you would grow an abundant harvest in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name. Salvation. 
morning. PTL. Hallelujah. Thank you guys. Amen. You know, um, it was nice to have uh, Pastor Matthew. I never say my name up here. It's usually a joke or two, you know. But this morning, when we started staying in the Star Spangled Banner, and we hear that first verse, well, there's three, right, Mike? Four, three, okay. And you get to the second one, you're like, how many are like, whoa, where, that goes with that too? And we never sing that part. You know, but isn't that true about the word of God? Today when we go downstairs, we're going to go to 1 Samuel 3.10. And Samuel kept getting up. He kept hearing, Samuel, Samuel. So he kept running to Elijah, and he goes, what do you need? Do you need anything? Do you need anything? And then he'd go back to bed, and it happened again. And finally, Eli's like, I'm not calling you. Nobody else is calling you. It's the Lord. So after the second time, he told him on the third time, say, here I am, Lord. I'm your servant. Speak to me. They challenged us this week to take the time to listen to God. You know, we pray. Um, sometimes when anybody at the elders meeting, they probably want a button to shut me off. But sometimes we got to be quiet before the Lord. And during that time, when you just let things go and give it all and talk to him, just like he's been there the whole time, which he has, tell him everything. Lay it all out. And then when you get quiet, the next day, they asked us to write down any of your thoughts. And if you guys are like me, you probably have, oh, my gosh, this has got to be done, that's got to be done. But write down your thoughts. There's something about journaling. Just write down your thoughts. And a good pastor, a disciple pastor that I knew, Pastor John, he said, give everything three days. Pray about it. See what the Lord has. Yes, no, or it might be a maybe for a while. And um, the neat thing about that is, after the third day, go back to your word and as you're reading it, read down everything you wrote. <laughs> read down. Read down it again. 
everything you wrote down. Now, anything that's not with the Bible, cross it off. And stick with the things that you have. And I thought that was amazing. And it made me think of the Star Sangle Banner because the second and the third verse we don't know about. Sometimes we don't take that step, second and third steps. And before I do the announcements, we all say, life is so busy. But Jesus said life was very busy. Remember, Jesus was very busy all the time. Jesus was busy all the time. People wanted to talk to him, but he was never in a rush. And he always took that time to get away with the Lord. Let us use that example. And as I set you up for everything going on at the church, <laughs> um, I want to bring you the announcements. But I, I just wanted to share that with you this morning. And, and the more things we do together, and I'm going to ask them, even with doing our homework and stuff, I'm going to ask them to start reading John, a chapter a day. And it's something about us all doing stuff together, praying together, praying at a certain time, reading the same, oh, I know that Tracy's reading the same thing today that I'm reading. I'm wondering what she thought of this one. And that's what draws us near. And same thing with everything we have at church. This draws us near. Tonight, don't forget about the insulation uh, service for pastor. And don't forget about desserts. For God's sakes, you got to bring your desserts. <laughs> there was a sign up in the back. But um, come join us and celebrate uh, the Lord bringing the pastor here. All right. Also, brand new, Steve, would you stand up for me? This is Steve, and on Friday nights, um, please lift him up in prayer all the time and everybody else that comes. We don't realize some of the things that are going on, even in our own communities, but lift them up and pray. And, we, you know, on Friday nights we meet and we just, they want to get closer to God. They want to take the bad things and fill them with what? The living word of God. And when we get into John, that is the living word of God. Also, mark your calendars. Uh, Mini VBS starts on July 17th and the 18th, which will lead right in to the carnival on the 19th, 6 to 8 p.m. And um, any questions about that, please see uh, Jen and Josh Briggs. Not, she's not a Briggs. She's a Switzer, just so you know. And if you keep looking at her name, I, I'll start calling her Jean instead of Jen, because it's spelled with a G. And, uh, but no, see Jen or Josh on uh, anything doing with VBS. See Steve, uh, Steve uh, Christ for uh, the Mount uh, Cyanide Men's Retreat. That's going to be July 11th and 13th coming up and stuff like that. Is Kelly here this morning? She's not. Well, Kelly and Bernie had an alien birthday. I was just going to ask how many years. We'll have to, she'll be there tonight, so we'll bug her on that. But, um, you know, last week wasn't, it was the first time Pastor starred that. I thought that was from God. Because what do we have? 65, 47, and 39. And then you shared, right? 19. So, that, you know what? Let's give everybody a big round of hand. Marriage is huge. Now we're going with the funeral. Yeah, let's all stand as we sing and prepare our hearts for communion. Rose to dance when 
when death was arrested and my life So this morning we are going to celebrate Holy Communion. So I'm just going to share a little bit with you um, and share some scriptures with you. And then we will have just a time of silence before the Lord to uh, consider our own, our own heart, our own relationship with God. And then we will uh, take of the bread and the wine together. So I just want to share this morning that communion what we are doing, what Jesus celebrated with his disciples is the giving of his body and the giving of his blood. That when these things were broken and when they were shed, 
that God would grant forgiveness of sins to whoever would believe. So when we take communion, um, it's, it's ritualistic in sense that we do it continually. We've done it many times. Um, we've, some of us have done it all throughout our lives, whether it be monthly or weekly or semi, like, semi-monthly, something like that. But the meaning of it through this type of tradition grows, okay? It grows and it deepens. So when we celebrate communion, we are remembering not only the death of Christ and the sacrifice that he bore on the cross in his body and shed blood, we are remembering and celebrating also the resurrection because we do not have eternal life with just one or the other. Okay? So you don't have eternal life in just believing that Jesus Christ died on the cross to save you from your sins. You must also believe that God raised him from the dead. So without the resurrection, there is no eternal life because we will share in that same resurrected life. Okay? So that's the, the fullness of the gospel. It's the fullness of what we're celebrating in communion today. So I just want to share with you some scripture from Matthew 26, uh, beginning in verse 26 through 28. Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. And then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And we have to know that by participating in communion and remembering the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ, by remembering this, we are celebrating that very thing until he comes again. So I want to encourage you this morning, we're going to take a time of silence. I want you to uh, consider your own spiritual life, your own walk with the Lord. Where are you at with him? Um, Are there things that you need to confess to him? Are there things that you need to talk to him about? And just, we're just going to take a a period of silence to do that. So um, after that, I'll invite you to share um, in our, our celebration of the broken body and the blood that was shed for our forgiveness of sins. We must be reassured that the body that was broken and the blood that was shed is more than sufficient to forgive not just your sins, but your brother's sins, your sister's sins, your cousin's sins, somebody who lived a thousand years ago sins, somebody, depending on when Christ comes back, somebody who lives 500 years from now, their sins. His blood is the all-sufficient sacrifice. There is, God is going to, God has forgiven it all for those who believe. So I invite you this morning, we're just going to take a a, a period of silence. Just consider your own heart uh, before the Lord and talk with him, and then uh, after that, we will uh, take of the body and the blood, our, our celebration of it through the bread and the wine together. So let's take a few moments of silence.
Father, we thank you for your gift of eternal life, the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that was broken and the blood that was shed on our behalf for forgiveness of sins. And as Jesus taught his disciples, saying, take his body and eat, <clears throat> and that this is his blood which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Lord, we thank you for that gift today. And we ask that when we receive um, these these. Um, elements, these representations of your body and blood, uh, Lord, that you would fill us with you, that you would purify us, that you would draw us closer to yourself, that you would give us a longing and a desire to walk with you more deeply and more truly, as the scripture said, that we would walk in spirit and in truth. Lord, we ask that you would draw us to yourself this morning. And we just ask that you would, as your word promises, that you would purify us from all unrighteousness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And when you are ready, uh, you can take of uh, the bread and the wine this morning. So as we begin our message today, this actually ties in quite well, um, I have to say what I, it's kind of, it's funny, but it's not funny. It's pausing and just being still and being silent. Can't you feel everything within you wanting to race forward to the next thing, right? Like, because there's so much going on in our day <clears throat> excuse me, so much going on in our day um, that we always want to race forward to the next thing, somehow thinking that we're going to, uh, that we're going to accomplish more um, by racing ahead to the next thing, and that's not always the case. <clears throat> excuse me. So sometimes you just have to, you just got to pause. So um, it's a very good thing, very good thing to pause in the midst of your day. So this ties in really well. We're just going to pray for uh, the message this morning, and we'll be continuing on with uh, this, this idea of letting go of things in life it can be very, very, very beneficial. So I wrote, I got writing last week, and I got kind of, Melanie and I joke about this, I got on what's called a soul train, <laughs> and I was just, man, I got writing and writing and writing, and then I realized, I'm like, you know what, if I do that all this week, I'll probably be up there for like an hour and a half. I'm like, so I actually have to break this up over two weeks. But it's a very good topic that is, I think, extremely beneficial. And I talked with some this morning who said, you know, this is really beneficial, this, this idea of we've got to let go of some stuff here. So let's pray together, and we'll, we'll get into the message for today. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for each and every person that's come. Father, we just ask that you would work in this place, uh, that, you would, that your words would go forth, and that people would hear them, and that they'd be planted in hearts, and that, uh, Lord, you would grow these things in us. Um, your word is, is power. It has come from the mouth of God. And um, as, as the scripture says, um, your words are spirit and they are life. So we're asking this morning as, as we study your word that uh, your Holy Spirit would bring that life to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So uh, this week we're actually going to just, I, I kind of wanted to put this thing in here. I saw at another church called Bringing Us Back, and that just means where were we last week? So we can kind of pick up from where we left off. So I just wanted to uh, bring you back to last week. I just want to review the three points that I made last week about the um, first part about letting go of stuff in life. The first one was let go of the sin confess to God, he will be faithful to purify you. The second one we had last week was let go of anger and frustration before 
you go to sleep because tomorrow is a new day. And the third one we had last week was let go of your control and submit to God's control. So those were three points last week just to kind of bring you back to um, kind of some things that we, we talked about and those, those main points, things that we can take and practice in our everyday lives. Um, so just wanted to bring you back. So we're going to continue on this week with this concept of letting go of stuff. Um, you can actually, the more you go through Scripture, you can find a whole ton of things that the Scripture teaches you uh, to let go of. So we're going to begin today with Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So this is a very common uh, verse that's quoted many times. A lot of people are familiar with it. But it's much harder to practice this verse than it is to read it or just uh, to, to hear it. So, but it does produce abundant spiritual fruit when you do it. This is a path that's laid out in the scripture that uh, helps us come to a place of peace. But it's a different kind of peace than maybe a, a lot of people uh, have an idea of what the peace is. Um, it's, it's a peace that places an active guard over your heart and mind and a peace that doesn't make sense. But there's a lot more to this, and we're going to dig into that. So there's an order to these verses that teach us how do we get to that sense of peace. And in order to get to that sense of peace, you're going to have to let go of something else in order to do what God says. So God sometimes will dangle a carrot in front of you to get you to do a few things. And if you want the peace of God bad enough, you'll do it God's way. And this is one verse that I have practiced and practiced and practiced in my meditation. So we've talked about this before. So meditation is very much God's idea. Rolling something over and over and over in your mind or, <coughs> excuse me, rolling, <coughs> excuse me, um, <coughs> rolling, <coughs> excuse me, rolling something over and over and over in your mind, or muttering something under your breath over and over and over, okay? So when we do that, so this one, be anxious for nothing. So this one I've tried in very, very, very difficult times in your life. Sometimes in, in prayer, or I just sit on the couch, and I would say, be anxious for nothing. I'd say it 100 times in a row, 200 times in a row, probably a lot more. And so when you do that, when you meditate on something from the Word of God, it begins to grow in your life. You can also choose to meditate on the wrong thing. If you meditate on your fear and anxiety, you will become more fearful and more anxious. So our words and our thoughts, they're like a spotlight. They shine and they light up anything that we talk about. So you have to choose a good meditation to roll over and over in your mind or mutter under your breath. And those things begin to to grow. God grows them in your life. <clears throat> so in this Philippians passage, I mean, let me, let me go back to that be anxious for nothing for a minute. So I did that enough. All of a sudden, the anxiety, it just fizzles. It disappears. It, it just leaves. And then that peace comes in. But it came as a result of meditating on God's word. And what does God's word teach us? It says to meditate on God's word all through the day and all through the night, right? So we should be doing it all the time. So in this Philippians passage, rejoice. It says rejoice. It's primary. So there is always something good to rejoice about. 
So rejoice is also a command, right? So there's all kinds of things you can rejoice about. You can rejoice that you got up this morning. You can rejoice you have clothes to wear. You can rejoice that you have food to eat. You can rejoice that you have something to drink. You can rejoice that you have a house to live in. You can, I mean, there's a million things you can find about to rejoice if you choose to look for something to rejoice about. There is always something to rejoice about. And you notice in the scripture, it's not like if you feel like rejoicing, rejoice. It's a command. It says, do it. Rejoice. Find something good in your life and rejoice about it. Be happy about it. So there are things to rejoice about. And if you don't feel like rejoicing, try finding something to rejoice over and rejoice over that and your feelings will catch up. So the story of the prodigal son. The son goes out and he squanders everything that he has and he wastes his inheritance and his life. When he returns, his father is so happy to see him that what does he do? He rejoices. He throws a party, get the fatted calf and put a ring on his finger and all this stuff. He rejoices, right? So he finds the one good thing that happened. Did the father list everything that went wrong with his son? No, he found the one good thing and he said, we are going to celebrate this one good thing. So that's what we need to do in our lives and that's what the scripture is saying. Rejoice. If you have nothing good in your life to rejoice about, just try to find one and make a big deal out of it and celebrate that one thing and rejoice about that one thing and forget about the other stuff. <clears throat> so a great quote by uh, Charles Spurgeon, people who are very happy, especially those who are very happy in the Lord, they're not likely to either give offense or take offense. Their minds are so sweetly occupied with higher things that they're not easily distracted by the little troubles which are naturally arise between such imperfect creatures as ourselves. Joy in the Lord is a cure for all discord. And Paul's joy wasn't based on a sunny optimism or a positive mental attitude as much as it was a confidence in a God who is in control. It really was a joy in the Lord. So another great quote by Spurgeon, what a gracious God we serve who makes delight to be a duty and who commands us to rejoice. Should we not at once be obedient to such a command as this? It is intended that we should be happy. So this is going to require us to let go of some things uh, to let go of some misery, some doubt, some fear, some worry. It's hard to do those things while you're rejoicing. You can't really praise God fully if you're busy hanging on to a lot of things you're supposed to let go of. So when we praise here in this morning, a lot of times people will say after praise or prayer time, man, I feel so good. It's like the burdens are lifted off my shoulders. My mind is clear. Why? All of your words have nothing to do with you. They're about praising God. And all of the focus went on to Jesus. And then people say, wow, my mind's clear. So why don't we do that the rest of our week, right? <laughs> so it's easy to do it in church when we've got like such a wonderful thing about this church. When you're up in front and you're singing, like in the, in the first couple pews, I don't know if you all know this back there, it's like this wall of sound that like washes up over the whole, uh, the whole sanctuary. It, it's wonderful. And just hearing all of those praises and it's so uplifting. And why do we, why, why is the sense so great when we, uh, when we are done praising? It's because all of our focus is on Jesus and it's not on us. So we gotta, we gotta carry that through our week. So next, uh, this Philippians verse says, don't be anxious about anything. So this is also a command and not an option. Undue care, it's like this. 
Care that belongs to God alone keeps God as God the Father, and it keeps you as a child of God. When you begin to take on the care that belongs to God alone, you're assuming his level of authority. You don't have his level of authority, okay? So we need to do what we're supposed to do, and God's doing what he's supposed to be doing. We should not assume the level of authority that God has and only God has. I was once in the pulpit, and I was giving a message. I don't, I don't even remember what it was about. And God said to me, clear as a bell, he said, stop trying to do my job. And I was like, whoa. I mean, that was, that was an intense thing to hear, to think that somehow I was trying to do God's job for him. You know, but that was, that was pretty intense. So how do you do this? Don't be anxious about anything. It's not easy. It is a spiritual discipline. And this is not, I have to say before I get into this, this is not to diminish anyone who has a, a very real problem with anxiety. Okay, I mean, I struggled with anxiety severely as a, as a teen um, and had different medications and things like that. So it's not to diminish. Um, I'm not saying real anxiety problems don't exist. That's not what I'm saying. But I just want to go and focus on what does the scripture say about this? So the scripture says, don't be anxious. Okay. So how do we do this? It's actually a lot less complicated than we think. You don't be anxious. So follow with me here. Sometimes you have to make a decision, not about how you feel. You have to decide, I'm not going to be anxious. Why? Because the scripture says, don't do it. Now, isn't it also true that we teach our kids, we say, don't touch a hot stove. Don't forget your, don't forget your lunch pail. Don't forget, um, don't forget to uh, wear sunscreen. Um, don't do this. Don't yell at your brother. Don't, uh, don't talk back to your parents. Things like, there's a lot of don't do this that parents teach their kids. And God is our perfect heavenly father, Right? And he's teaching us, don't be anxious. So there's very much a parallel there. So not being anxious, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that it's easy, okay? It's a practice. It's a discipline to not be anxious about anything. But it is a command, and it, it's right there in the scripture, it's not something different than we've taught our own kids or our parents taught us. There's do's and don'ts, right? Probably, you know, hundreds of do's and don'ts and even more that we've been taught. Really, we have to discipline ourselves to not be anxious about things. It's a discipline. It's work. But it's a simple thing, but it's profound. It's very powerful as well. Don't be anxious. And we don't have to overcomplicate it. We can't wait until we stop feeling anxious to make the decision to not be anxious. So you don't just do it. And when you try to discipline yourself to stop being anxious, what I'm saying is, is that there's hard work at first. It's developed you meditate on it. You say it over and over. You think it over and over. You can write it out over and over. You can just find that verse in your Bible and just read that one verse over and over and over. Okay? If you discipline yourself with God's help, you will be able to stop anxiety. Okay? You'll be able to let go of the anxiety. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. It's Matthew 26, 41. The saved spirit reacts to the presence and communion of the Holy Spirit so much faster than the flesh responds. Your flesh is very slow to react to the things of God. Would you agree? <laughs> the flesh is a little slow, 
in wanting to do what God wants to do, right? So that's why you can't rely on how you feel. You have to go with the word of God. And that's how you can let go of the anxiety. So moving on to where the scripture says, with thanksgiving and prayer, we present a request to God. It's going to require us to let go of our need and ability to solve every problem on our own. Paul wrote that everything is the proper subject of prayer. There are not some areas of our life that are not concerning to God. So when the scripture says prayer and supplication, there are two aspects of prayer. They're similar, but they're distinct. Prayer is a broader word that can mean all of our communication with God, but supplication directly asks God to do something. Many of our prayers go unanswered because we do not ask God for everything. So a lot of times we'll ask God for this, but it's like, I can do this, this, and this, right? Well, God does the big stuff, but I can do this and this and this, right? And then we wonder, well, where's God? Well, why didn't God work on this and this and this? We have to ask him for everything. So that's why it says, let your requests be made known. God already knows our requests before we pray them. Yet he will often wait for our participation through prayer before granting what we have requested. He wants that communication with us. So when a scripture says, with thanksgiving, this guards against whining, against complaining before God when we make our requests known. We, can't, we can really be anxious for nothing, pray about everything, and be thankful for anything. We simply can't do everything in life that life requires on our own. And in fact, God did not design us to do it on our own. He called us to lean on him, to trust him, and ask for his help in everything that we do. And this will require us to let go of our own abilities. It's not that you don't try your best. It's you try your best with God's help. And you just, sometimes you just have to give up and let God do everything because he's better at it than we are. So if you do these things, it will lead to a peace that guards your heart and mind. The Greek word here for guard is phoreo. It makes a peace that we enter into so much more powerful. It's an active peace that stands guard over your heart and mind. This word, this guard, means to be like a military sentinel that actively displays whatever defensive and offensive means are necessary to guard. So it really warps my sense of God's peace. I think a lot of people see like peace as this ethereal feeling or just this general, well, I'm not really frustrated about anything or kind of like a floating on a cloud type of a feeling. Well, many of these things, they, it's kind of what people have adopted as this is what peace is. But the Greek word here means that the peace from God is very serious. It acts as a military guard to protect you and your heart and mind from the attacks of the devil. So this guard of your mind has nothing to do with your efforts and your abilities to be peaceful, but rather once you have rejoiced and decided to stop with the anxiety, with God's help, prayed and given thanks to God, the peace goes to work protecting you. It's not you're trying to be peaceful. It's the peace is protecting you. A peace that will actively defend you. And when we look at this word, it means both defensive and offensive, this guarding. And it, it's by whatever means necessary. So isn't that pretty great? If we will do the things that God wants us to do and it leads to this guarding of peace, that peace is a very, very powerful, it's almost, it's like a military thing, like a guard actively guarding your heart and mind, both defending you and offensively as well against the enemy. That's why I brought up this slide, and this is in your bulletin as well. 
So I, I just wanted, um, I guess, a visual to show you, like, we need to think of how it's guarding us. The, the peace is not just a, a happy feeling, an ethereal feeling, some kind of a light feeling, but it's acting like a military guard. Okay, so I just wanted to um, kind of make this little diagram for you and share that with you, and uh, we can fill in here for the peace of God from Philippians 4, 7. The Bible describes three great aspects of peace that relates to God. There's peace from God. Paul continually uses this as an introduction to his letters and reminds us that peace comes as a gift from God. There's peace with God. It describes a relationship we enter into with God through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And the peace of God, spoken in Philippians 4, 7, it's beyond all mind. It's beyond all the power of comprehension and thinking. So the peace that surpasses all understanding, it isn't that it's senseless and impossible to understand, but it's beyond our ability to understand and explain. So therefore, it must be experienced. The peace doesn't just surpass the understanding of the worldly man. It surpasses all understanding. Even the godly man cannot comprehend the fullness of God's peace. Psalm 103.2 says, Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. In order to enter into the peace of God and experience it, this peace that not just guards you, it both protects you defensively and offensively against the enemy. You will need to let go of your own way because all the things we just studied are not our way. That's God's way. So this is your first note here. Let go of your ways. God's ways are better. Next, we're going to look at Proverbs 29.11. Proverbs 29.11. Fools give full vent to their rage, but the wise bring calm in the end. So as Christians, and we looked at this last week, I believe, as well, we have to learn to let go of anger and frustration. So we studied this last week with a different passage about settling your anger before the sun goes down. But here in this verse... There's a lot of things that encourage us to let go of anger. So, and it doesn't have to be like a raging anger, like beat right in the face, eyes bugging out of your head. It can be a minor one, or it can be a frustration. But this verse teaches us that there, um, that there are both fools and there are those who are wise. And a lot of times in life, have you you've heard people say that, you know, it's really, really good to let it all out and get things off your chest? right? So we, we, we've heard that before, right? I mean, it can, be, it can be helpful at times or in limited doses, but it is important in the Christian life to not let the anger that we have become the vast majority of our focus. So Jesus is the high priest according to our confession in Hebrews 3, 1. This I quoted from the NASB, which is a word for word. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, who is Jesus. We don't often apply the word to Jesus, but he is our apostle. The ancient Greek word translated apostle really means something like ambassador. And in this sense, Jesus is the Father's ultimate ambassador. That's found in Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. God the Father had to send a message of love that was so important. He sent it through Jesus Christ. There is a, uh, the ancient Greek word for consider does not mean simply to look at or notice something. Anyone can look at a thing or even notice it without seeing it. But the word means to fix attention on something in such a way that its inner meaning, the lesson it's designed to teach, may be learned. 
The same word here, same Greek word for consider, is used in Luke 12, 24, consider the birds of the air. It's an earnest appeal to look and to learn and to understand. The message is plain. Consider this. Consider that God loves you so much that he sent the ultimate messenger, Christ Jesus. Consider also how important it is for you to pay attention to God's ultimate apostle, who is Jesus Christ. God also chose his original authoritative ambassadors for the church, and these we think of as the original 12 apostles. And God still chooses ambassadors in a less authoritative sense, in the kind of sense that we are all ambassadors for God. We are all, if you are a believer, you are sent from God to carry his gospel, his light, his message into the world, okay? So Jesus Christ is the Father's ultimate ambassador. Well, what does this mean? Jesus is the high priest. He intercedes before God the Father Almighty according to what? Our confession. The high priest, Jesus, he's the one who supremely represents us before the Father and who represents the Father to us. God cares for us so much he put the ultimate mediator between God and man, the ultimate high priest between a holy God and a sinful man. So what is our confession? There's a couple of things here, and I want to be uh, very um, careful and a little bit detailed about how I present this. Um, so what is, what is confession? Confession is what's coming out of our mouth. So Christianity... Um, has confession that's made both with your mouth and with your life. So the word confession means to say the same thing. So when we confess our sin, we say the same thing about our sin that God does. In regard to salvation, all Christians say the same thing about their need for salvation and God's forgiveness in Jesus Christ. We just had communion this morning. So any Christian that is celebrating communion this morning all around the world is saying the same thing. We have the same confession. We have a need for God to forgive us of our sin. That's the confession. So in context, Hebrews 3.1 is about your salvation and that confession. You confess that you believe that Jesus died on the cross to save you from your sins and that God raised him from the dead. But Jesus still continually intercedes for all of our prayers before the Father. He is that mediator between God and man. But it's always according to his will and his word. This is not what's called name it and claim it. Okay? Just because we say whatever we want to say, and we think, oh, well, I confessed it, so therefore Jesus is going, to, is going to intercede with God, and he has to get exactly what he wants. Like, there's the common thing that says, like, Jesus is not a vending machine, right? So you can't put in your prayer and just press whatever buttons you want and out pops whatever you want, right? So Jesus intercedes before the Father according to his will and the word of God, right? That's how he intercedes before the Father. There's also a lot going on just in culture about positive affirmations and manifesting, okay? And this is even done in, in secular culture. Um, you deserve it. You're, you're the greatest person ever born. Um, everything is working in your, for your good and in your direction. Um, something amazing is going to happen to you today. Well, when you're saying that as a non-believer... So what you're doing is you're trying to make those things manifest in your life by your own power. Okay, so you're trying to make them happen by your own power. It's completely the opposite for believers because it's a work of the Holy Spirit. Anything good that happens in your life comes from obedience, following the leading of the Holy Spirit, being in the Word of God. Every good thing that you have comes from God, and that's not a work of, it's not your work. It's a work of God in your life because Ephesians tells us that it, it should not be by works so that no man should boast, 
right? We can't boast about the good things in our lives because it's not from us. It's not our power at work. It's God's power at work producing good things in our lives. So, when all the, what, but if you consider Jesus is definitely listening to your prayers. Jesus is definitely listening to your praises. And guess what? We're studying about anger here. Jesus is very much hearing your anger. So what I'm saying is, if all that is coming out of your mouth is anger, that becomes the entirety of your relationship with God. Okay? If that's all that's coming out, Jesus is in heaven going before the Father according to our confession, continually and saying, look, he's angry. So the more that you confess that anger, that's, that's what's growing. The more that you confess that anger in your life, that's what will grow because it's what's coming out of our mouths. Jesus acts as high priest, interceding, getting between you and God. That's what the high priest does. And this points back to the Old Testament days when it required a high priest to offer sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins to shed blood in order to have relationship with God. High priests were required in order to maintain uh, for the forgiveness of sins. There had to be a continual shedding of blood on behalf of the nation of Israel. Sacrifices, sacrifices, sacrifices. God's people, Israel is God's people. He chose out of the world. But they did not intercede between God and man in any way like Jesus can. What man said was less important than the act of the high priest did under the Old Covenant or in the Old Testament. It was a ritualistic sacrifice, the shedding of blood, that brought about forgiveness of sin from God towards man. But here we see that Jesus now acts as high priest in accordance with what is coming out of our mouth. Now again, back to the, the ultimate thing is salvation. That's the ultimate thing, okay? But Jesus definitely hears your prayers, and he hears your praises. So how often during the day or week, uh, or when in particular, when you're really angry with someone, or you're angry about something, do you really consider what you're saying? So Jesus hears, he is close to the believer, and he intercedes before the Father. Many times we consider what we're saying when we're praying would you agree? When you pray, you're, you consider what you're saying, right? Okay, what about when you're angry? When you're angry, are you really considering what you're saying, or are you just spouting off, right? So, it is not a bad thing to get something off your chest, but it can't be the majority of what you're doing. And I'm not saying it's wrong to be, to be angry about something for a time. Like we saw before, be angry but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down when? On, or, or, oh, sorry, do not let the, I just gave you the answer, didn't I? Do not let the sun go down on your anger. So I'm saying, you can be angry. We talked about last week. Hey, 11.59 p.m., you got to be done with it. So figure out a way by that time. <clears throat> but God placed a limit on anger. We can be angry for a bit. Sometimes we need to get something off our chest, that's fine. But the 90% should not be, as this verse puts it, which is giving full vent to our rage. That would classify us as a fool. So it's the nature of a fool to think that <clears throat> everyone is interested <clears throat> in all of your feelings and that he has some obligation to pass on all of his feelings to others. This is a foolish offense to self-respect self-restraint, and courtesy towards other people. We can be angry with God for an eternity, and he will still love us. But what God is hearing, coming not only from your mouth, but also what Jesus intercedes before the Father, according to what's coming out of your mouth, it can't be just the anger. <clears throat> Does anybody in here know someone who's usually angry? I know people in my life who are just, just kind of angry people. They're just angry. Like, a lot of the time, they're just angry. That'd be sad if that became a majority of our relationship with God, right? That it's just about the anger. So we have to learn to let go of this. A lot of times, the world will tell you to get all of it out. Get it all out. Let it all out. And it seems this verse 
The advice in the scripture is to get some of it out and let God deal with and handle and take care of the rest. In fact, the second half of this verse in Proverbs contrasts the fool with the wise. And what are the characteristics of the wise? The wise brings a calm. We also studied how there's a time and a season last week, Ecclesiastes, for everything under heaven. It includes, you can be angry for a bit about something, but however, we looked at two verses last week and this week that show that anger needs to have limits in order for us to be healthy in our relationship with God and with others. It's all right to be angry for a bit, but then we need to move on and get our confession, what we say, back in agreement with the word of God. The wise man knows that there's a time and a place to vent one's feelings, but one should never imitate the fool in exposing all of his feelings. All truths are not fit for all times, and that's why we need to pray about discernment. And this is a personally number one hard for me. Sometimes you just need to be silent. You know how difficult it is for me to be silent? And just, but I'm learning, right? I'm only like practicing. Like sometimes I just like, you know? So an easy way to be silent. If you have a trouble with being silent, an easy way is decide. When you get up in the morning, say, God, I'm not going to speak at all. If you happen to speak through me and all of a sudden my mouth opens and something comes out, I'm going to trust that it's the Holy Spirit. But you take a posture of silence. You just be like, you know what? I'm just not going to talk. I'm just going to. And then if something does come flying out when you're talking with somebody or something, but you have like the, the attitude of, I'm just, I'm going to like, I'm just going to be silent. And God, hey, if you're speaking through me, great. Okay. How do we know if the Holy Spirit's speaking through you? You need to know the word of God, right? So you can actually kind of resign yourself, so to speak, from you speaking. Just say, God, if you want to speak through me today, speak through me. So does what this is saying, it needs to sound like the word, like what I'm saying, if it's God speaking, it's going to have something to do with the word. It's got to reflect in the word somehow. That's how you know that God's talking and that he's speaking through you. So notice that the Bible doesn't tell us to be angry without limit. We must learn to be wise, to ask for God's help in controlling our tongue. Like it's talked about in the scripture about how, you know, like, like the tongue, like it's just, it's just this, you can't, it's so hard to tame, like you can't control it. But we need to learn to control the tongue that we may let go of anger and come to that place of calmness and peace. Many times we think being angry about something may change a situation. You ever, you ever feel like that? Like, man, if I'm angry about this, like something's going to change? Or I've been there. So, or maybe it'll change a person. Man, if I'm really, really angry about this, well, you know, it'll change. Well, maybe not. So emotions are sourced in the flesh. We did this many weeks ago. And many times our feelings lie to us and they cannot be trusted. I teach my own children a lot of times that their feelings are lying to them. It's just a little short thing I say, your feelings are lying to you. If your feelings are not lining up with the word of God, they're going to trick you. They're going to lie to you. They're going to try to pull you away. So many people are emotional decision makers because emotion feels so real in the moment. But the word never teaches us to trust our emotions or how we feel. The word teaches us to trust in the word of God. Psalm 910, and those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Psalm 28:7, the Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts, and I am helped. My heart exalts. And with my song, I give thanks to him. Isaiah 26, 3 through 4, you keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. So we're going to take a look at this Proverbs 29, 11 in the Hebrew here. And it reads like this, all his feelings Vents a fool. 
but a wise man until afterwards holds them back. So when we look in the Hebrew, the word all here means complete. A fool will vent his feelings completely. And notice it doesn't say that you can't vent your feelings partially. The word for feelings here is defined as temper. So a fool, and listen to how this word is both defined and used. This word for a fool, it means it's defined as a stupid person. Dullard, who is dull and not sharp. That's what that word means there. It goes on, you find at other verses in Proverbs, a fool hates knowledge, delights, does not delight in understanding, and th considers mischief and trouble a, like a sport, like it's fun. So when you take all this together, you can say that a fool is not the sharpest knife in the drawer. He says stupid things. He completely and fully vents his anger and rage hates knowledge, and delights in not understanding, and treats getting in trouble like it's fun. That's, that's taken all together. That's what this is, describing what is a fool. This is what happens when we will not let go of anger, and we just go on and on and on and on about it. That's the fool. So we want to be wise. And what's the wise? The wise here is meaning intelligent and skillful. So what is this saying in this verse? It takes some intelligence, some skill. Sometimes in order to be wise and to learn to let go of anger, there may need to be some skill involved, some intelligent thinking. So if you struggle with letting go of anger and you know that you struggle with letting go of anger, you may have to think ahead and plan we may have to spend some time pondering and thinking about how am I going to not give full vent to my anger. Skills have to be honed and pressed, practiced. Skills are not spiritual gifts, okay? Uh, I play the piano. It wasn't a spiritual gift, okay? Do I think God gave me talent for that? Sure, all right? But there's a lot of non-believers who are great piano players, right? So it's not a spiritual gift. I had to practice that skill, okay? So skills have to be honed and practiced. So go to God if you struggle with anger or letting go of something. Let him teach you how to skillfully manage your words, especially if, when you're angry. And the English doesn't always give us an ac like a, a, a deep, deep, deep understanding of what's in the Hebrew and Greek. But here it says the wise holds back his words. And more accurately, it says the wise is skillful and intelligent, but this holds back when you, when you study that word in Hebrew. It's soothe or still. Soothe and still. So the scripture is not painting a picture that we can't express our feelings to God. We, we can go to God with anything and we should feel free to, but there's a proper balance and an anger with God or others or a situation should not be the vast majority of your prayer life and of your spiritual life. There is a limit. So instead of assuming that we should just never, or we should go off the other end of the spectrum and never voice, never voice our feelings or anger, that's not correct either. So we should still them or soothe them. There is never a better place to be than in prayer or praise or the presence of God than when you're angry, <laughs> angry or upset. So this is a place where God can still or soothe your feelings or your temper. So this is a little joke here because this is a very serious message, but a little joke here is that um, we bought Melanie's. M Melanie's family is uh, like food is like number one. Like food is like the number one purpose of every family event every occasion, every birthday, like the, the gifts and the celebration and other stuff is kind of like a lesser thing, but like it's like what's happening with the food and who's bringing it and who's making it what. We bought Melanie's dad a sign for Christmas one time or something. It's, a, it's a, like a square or a rectangle, but it's got this like piece kind of, it looks like somebody chomped it and like bit the side of it out, 
and it just says, I'm sorry about what I said when I was hungry. <laughs> so, so we bought that for her dad because it's, it's very fitting uh, for her dad. It's, it's just funny, but it's true, right? Like, if you're really, really hungry, like, you're going to say some stuff that you're like, you didn't really mean that, you know. Um, so, but that, that's, true for, that's true for her family. But it's true. Like, when we're, when we're angry about things, we're not really thinking about what we're saying. So perhaps we should take a different approach with angry feelings as opposed to either just giving full vent to them or just saying nothing about them. It's neither. The next time you're angry, what about going the stillness route or the soothing route? Because that's what that word means there, a stillness or a soothness. So you can go to God and you can ask him, either God, show me how to still this anger or to soothe this anger, or God, soothe my anger, still it within me, right? You can do both of those things, and that will make it a lot easier for you to let go of those things. And if you do these things, it puts you back in the category of the wise. So we have the fool and we have the wise. And this is your next sermon note here, which is let go of the anger be wise, still, and soothe negative emotions. And again, just two ways. You can ask God to do it for you, which is probably more effective, or you can ask God to show you how. How, either God, you still and soothe these things within me, or God, show me how to still and soothe these things with your help, of course. So just kind of um, to wrap this up and review a few of the things, uh, your, your notes and things that we talked about today. So just uh, remember at the bottom of your um, insert there about the Philippians 4, 7, this is a powerful piece. It is active. It is not floating on a cloud. It is a piece that acts like a military guard. It's both defensive and offensive against what would threaten your peace. And how you get to that piece, look in Philippians 4, 7, and you go back a few verses, and it lists about rejoicing and don't be anxious about anything, and with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. Follow these steps. Follow them in order. And I'm not saying that, like, God's not like a formula, right? It's not you know, every single time that you try to do this, it's just going to A plus B equals C. But there is something that is laid out in the scripture of if you'll do these things, God will help you get to that place of this piece, which is certainly not the floating on the cloud kind of a piece. This is a very serious piece where the peace does the work keeping you peaceful. It's not you trying to be peaceful. The second one that we talked about was let go of your ways. God's ways are better. And it's just easy way. When you're going about something, this or that, and you're sensing frustration or you're sensing like, man, why isn't this working out no matter what I do? Consider, well, is this God's way or is it my way? You know, it's just a very easy way to be like, if it's my way, I'm probably going to be frustrated. If it's God's way, he's going to lead you and he's going to guide you and it'll be much better. Last one was let go of the anger, be wise, still and soothe negative emotions. Like that will help you to let go of anger and frustration. So um, I really, really hope that um, some of these things were helpful to you this morning, and I, I really do pray that um, as we go about our week that you'll be encouraged that there are, you know, God is not making it, he doesn't, he's not trying to make it harder for you. <laughs> God is not just trying to make everything difficult, like his yoke is easy, his burden is light. He is, you know, if we'll do it his way, things will go much better, much better. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for showing us so much in your word that there are ways that you provide us and that you help us to do. We can let go of some things in life that we would not be so burdened and so uh, weighed down and heavy laden. Um, but you have provided through your son, Jesus Christ, you have provided not just liberation from uh, from sin and death, but you have provided liberation from heaviness and weariness and restlessness and hopelessness and, and um, 
you provided a, a, a way out and a way up in this life. Um, so I just pray that you would uh, help us this week to continue to meditate on your word and these things, um, and that you would just really grow these things in our life, that we would see you showing up in very, very powerful ways, um, and that you would turn them into a great testimony uh, for the work that you can do in our lives. We ask it in your son's name. Amen. Come thou fount, use my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for your courts above. Let's all stand as we sing.
I want to encourage you today that like that song said he stands in the fire beside me so as you go about this week just take that with you you are not alone he goes through the fire with you in life lord bless this congregation today lord i do pray that there will be uh there will be a hunger for you a hunger to walk more closely with you to hear your voice to be courageous, to follow your leading, and to obey. And we just ask that every person who leaves here today uh, would be filled with your Holy Spirit to overflowing and abundance. In your son's name we pray. Amen.